Okay, so today's lecture is going to be on Bitcoin IRL. Um, what that means is how the normal user interfaces with the Bitcoin network, whether you just want to buy and sell Bitcoins, or if you want to support the network as a full node. Um, my name is Rusty Lin, if you guys don't already know me. I think Gloria gave me an intro in the first lecture. I wrote a bunch of notes for this class last semester. Um, I'm also part of blockchain at Berkeley. I'm the website manager for both decal, the fundamentals, and developers. I'll be giving the first half of the lecture today. Second half will be covered by Nadir, our main lecturer. Wait, what? There we go, OK. Um, so lecture overview, I'm going to be going over wallet types and wallet mechanics. Uh, that's the user interface, or uh, um, what the normal user would use to send and receive Bitcoins. And Nadir is going to cover the other half, which is about uh, running a full node, uh, mining incentives, real world mining, and also changing Bitcoin in uh, uh, BIPs, they're called. So before we get into wallet types, actually, and what exactly a wallet is, it's important to uh, reaffirm our understanding of identity in Bitcoin. So everyone in Bitcoins are uniquely identified by their private key. And of course, you can get your private key, which is a huge random number. You pass it through EXTA, which is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, and you get your public key. And you hash your public key to get your address. And uh, addresses are still pretty big, and like some characters look the same anyways. So we employ a scheme called Base58. We get rid of the ambiguity that arises between characters that look the same. So four of them look the same, Base58. And um, addresses, like, they are kind of easier to read now that we have base 58, but they're still huge numbers, and pretty much anything you do in the Bitcoin network depends on your identity. So it'd be a lot easier if we had some sort of software to keep track of our keys for us. And that's where Bitcoin wallets come in. So um, what a Bitcoin wallet is at the most fundamental level is a way to keep track of your private key. Right? There might be some features that come along with it, including storing, sending, receiving transactions, but those are general like additions to what the core wallet is. And wallets come in two main flavors. There's hot wallets and cold storage wallets. Um, and we give them these names in relation to their connection to the internet. Hot wallets are always connected to the internet, while the cold storage wallets uh, conversely are not. Um, so hot wallets, some examples are sm smartphone apps, Mycelium and Airbits. Personally, I use Airbits. It's pretty cool. Um, there's online web wallets as well, such as blockchain.info and coinbase.com. Important thing to note about online web wallets is that your private key is actually stored on a third party, like their own like cloud servers. So you don't actually have um, you don't have the power to maintain your own private key, and that's going to be very important. Keep it in the back of your mind. We'll be going over it later. Um, cold storage wallets, so they're not connected to the internet. There's paper wallets, which literally is just like a piece of paper. You write down your private key and you lock it in a, a safe or something. Make sure it doesn't burn or anything. Um, there's websites such as bitaddress.org and bitcoinpaperwallet.com. There's these websites. So like, once you visit the website, they'll tell you to download the website, cut off your internet connection. And then once you run the website, you can like move your mouse around, generate some entropy, and like you have your private key. You write it down somewhere, or you can print it, and you put it in a safe. Um, hardware wallets, kind of the same idea, but um, the same idea in that they're not connected to the internet. They're these like small little hardware guys you plug into your computer through USB. Transaction gets sent through uh, USB to these hardware wallets, and um, they sign transactions in what are known as trusted execution environments. So the hardware wallet itself isn't connected to the internet while your PC might be. So the point is um, the signature, the generation of the signature of your transaction is done in a trusted and secure environment. And a uh, third category of brain wallet of um, wallets that cold storage wallets that we're going to be going over is uh, brain wallet. And Brain Wallet is pretty straightforward. It's just a series of uh, mnemonics or English characters or words that you pick that you might be able to memorize pretty easily. 
you take those and you hash them through some sort of one-way hash algorithm, such as SHA-256, and there's your private key. Uh, problem with some brain wallets, though, is that you, there's no real way to rate limit the brute force of a brain wallet. So say you pick the, the last line of a famous movie or something, people can always just like find scripts for these movies and brute force their way and find your private key. Um, and that's because humans aren't really as random as we think we might be. We'll like choose a character or choose a series of words and it might be from somewhere else. Uh, one way we can mitigate this brute force attempt is by key stretching. The idea behind this is you take your original brain wallet and just hash it a bunch of times. Right? You take the output, you shove it back into the input, etc. You do this upwards of like 2 to the 20th times. So now if someone's trying to brute force their way to your private key, they'd have to guess your initial set of words, your mnemonic, as well as the number of times you hash. And that increases the difficulty by which they can get to your private key. Okay, you guess hash and hash and hash. All right, um, so choosing a wallet. Like I said previously, um, online web wallets such as Coinbase will actually store your private key on a third-party cloud server. And you might not want this because, say, Coinbase goes down, your private key goes down with it, then you lose all your money. Or you might be clumsy and say that, like, if I keep track of my own private key, you might lose it. So you want to delegate that responsibility to Coinbase. Honestly, it's up to you guys. Do your own due diligence. Find a wallet that works for you. I know there's a bunch of wallets that have uh, extra features, such as multi-signature and extra privacy. Um, that's for your own research. <laughs> and here are just a couple wallet options that we listed. There's Coinbase, Mycelium, Electrum, etc. Do your own research. All right, so you have wallet software now and ways to keep track of your private key. But how exactly do you get Bitcoin in the first place? All right? Bitcoin's not just some magic internet money, as the, the Reddit image would say. Um, but yeah, how do you exactly get Bitcoins? So luckily for us, there is a Bitcoin ATM on 1250 University Avenue. It looks like that. And essentially what you do is you take your Bitcoin smartphone app, a Bitcoin wallet smartphone app, there's a QR code with your address on it. You scan it in, and then you just like put in some US dollars into this ATM, you send the money, and boom, you have Bitcoin. Actually, I haven't been here before, I want to go. All right, um, there's also exchanges, right? You guys are probably familiar. Exchanges just trade between different types of currency. And exchanges are actually what determine the market value of Bitcoin because you are buying and selling Bitcoin from different types of currency. Uh, again, do your own due diligence. There's a bunch of uh, exchanges out there that may or may not be more secure than the rest. Uh, there's a bunch of stories actually about famous uh, exchanges like crashing, like there's Mt. Gox. And just last year, there was Bitfinex that lost 120,000 Bitcoin. It was August of 2016. Don't quote me on that. Um, and yeah. Exchanges, there's centralized and decentralized exchanges. Centralized exchanges, there's a single point of failure. So you may or may not want that. So uh, on the other side, decentralized exchanges. Uh, trades happen peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no third-party company or organization that holds your funds while they're being traded. And this allows for trustless uh, trading. And examples of decentralized exchanges might be BitSquare, BitShares, OpenLedger, NXD, and Counterparty. Uh, let me check the time. All right. Any questions? All right. Section 2, Wallet Mechanics. So you might recall from a previous lecture that Full nodes on the Bitcoin network have to download like this huge blockchain. It's 140 gigabytes right now. Um, meanwhile, if you just download a Bitcoin smartphone app wallet, it, it's like only a couple megs. And the reason for this is because we have this technology called simple payment verification. And what this allows us to do is to check the 
validity of transactions, whether these transactions were included in a block previously by just querying the Bitcoin network. So if someone sends me a trans transaction, I want to make sure it's legit. I'll query the Bitcoin network for full nodes, and the full nodes will tell me the Merkle root and Merkle branches necessary to construct the Merkle proof to prove that this transaction was included in a block previously. And um, this way you don't have to download the entire blockchain, you can just use the network and talk to other guys. Um, SPV nodes, they're called simple payment verification. They're also called lightweight or thin clients. And uh, this is the proof earlier I was talking about. There's the Merkle tree and the Merkle branch to prove that the transaction was inside a previous block. So um, one thing to mention about SPV nodes is that we have to make a couple assumptions to, to make sure that they work correctly. One assumption being that the incoming block headers, so uh, the things that these full nodes on the network are telling you, you have to make sure those are real. And um, in the long term, you can kind of assume that they are true because it is expensive for malicious activity to be sustained. <laughs> right? uh, Nidhir talked about how you need like more than 50% of the hash network hash power to make any sort of attack on the network. And um, so yeah, in the long term, the chain is probably honest. And realistically, if you really do want to um, sell Bitcoin or buy Bitcoin, make transactions on your phone, you can't really afford to have 140 gigs on your phone just for the blockchain anyways. So it's a decent trade. I think the size trade-off is 1 1,000th. And uh, again, one of the features that a Bitcoin wallet might provide is uh, multi-sig, multi-signature, and this allows for M of N transactions. Uh, what that means is that imagine you have um, a company and the company has N people on the board of uh, executive board. Uh, you delegate that there must be at least N of those N people that agree on something to move forward with the, the board agenda. And uh, that's basically it. I think we covered this in the previous lecture as well. So in this diagram, there's three people on the top, call them like Alice, Charlie, and Dave. Um, there's three of them, and they're enabling what's called two of three multi-signature. So the first two people agree, while the third person doesn't, that's fine. You reach two thirds. Um, you can send the transaction, and Bob on the other hand, uh, on the other end, can receive this transaction. Um, also, it's best practice to never reuse any pseudonyms in Bitcoin. And uh, the reason you want to do this is because you don't want anyone to keep track of how much Bitcoin you actually own. Uh, imagine like every comment you make on Reddit, you make a new account. That's basically the point. So no one can keep track of your activity on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it is generally really computationally inexpensive to generate new keys anyways, so you might as well. And also, compromising one key is independent from compromising another because you are generating random numbers, and those should be independent. Um, wallet software will usually handle this, but the way they handle this might differ. It used to be that whenever you generated a new address, you just keep some sort of list backup for every address you make. And imagine if you make like thousands of transactions, you'd have a, like a huge list of a thousand addresses. Uh, these were implemented in what's called JBOC wallets. JBOC standing for just a bunch of keys. And it's not really convenient like if you make a bunch of transactions. So nowadays we have what are called hierarchical deterministic wallets, or HD wallets. And these function on a, in a different way. So you start off with a seed key or a master key, and you can use that key to, do, to generate more private keys, or private public key pairs. Uh, you do this with the seed and an index number. So say if you want to generate the 50th key, then you say index equals 50. 
and also some optional chain code. Um, this is in BIP32, I think. Uh, Nadir is going to talk about that later, and the chain code is just some extra way to include entropy in your uh, calculations. Also, a side note, exchanges use HD wallets, because if you imagine you're trading a bunch of different currencies, you need a bunch of addresses, and it'd be hard on the server if you had to keep track of all those. And here's a little diagram. So you can see you have the parent key and the index number and some optional parent chain code. You hash everything together and you can derive children keys. And at a high level, here's what's going on. You have a master seed and using the master seed you can generate children. And those children can generate children. So imagine you sign up for an exchange and you register your user and your user is assigned a seed key. And every time you want to make a new address, you can just run a calculation and have a new address. Uh, this way, the exchange won't have to keep updating the huge list of addresses, and it's easy on their servers, easy to calculate. And now Nadir is going to go over full nodes in the Bitcoin network. Thank you, Rusty. All right, so how many of you have actually tried mining before? Whether it be with your CPU or some fancy GPU setup, uh, anything? All right, yeah, that's a decent amount of people. All right, so well, the question is, why do we do things like, why do you mine? Why do we get up in the morning? Why do we pet dogs, right? It's all around one central theme, profit, right? If you can't see that, profit. Right? Everything we do revolves around profit, and mining is no different. So the classic scheme for profit is that if your revenue is greater than your cost, then you're going to get some profit out of it. Right. So the way that this looks to a miner is based on like how much they get versus how much they spend. But to evaluate what they're going to need to do or how much they're going to make, first you need to understand what a miner does. All right. So as Rusty mentioned, you have the thin clients. But for a full-fledged node, you need to do all of these things in order to be a legitimate miner. You need to first and foremost download the entire blockchain transaction history. You need to verify any incoming, trans incoming transactions, which you store in what's called a mempool. You create new, uh, a new block using those transactions. You know, you'll have a list of transactions, hash them up to a Merkle root, generate the Merkle root. You get the, pre uh, the previous block hash, and then you find a valid nonce, which is the proof of work slash mining part that we discussed in the last lecture. Finally, once you've found that nonce, once you've done the hard part, you submit your block to the network, and you hope that your block is going to be accepted by the network and eventually incorporated into the longest chain. And finally from there, if all of that is successful, you profit. So the breakdown of how miners get revenue and how they get costs looks like this. The revenue is the block reward plus transaction fees and the costs are fixed costs versus variable costs. And as you can see, if the mining revenue is greater than the mining cost, we get profit. So first we'll look at the block reward. And so the block reward is something that a miner receives uh, every time that they submit a valid block to the network with a Coinbase transaction towards themselves. Currently, there is a reward of 12.5 per block, and as pre previously mentioned, this reward has been having since Bitcoin was first deployed. It started at 50, then to 25, then 12.5, then to 12.5, and over time it'll become zero in around 2140. And by then, you will have no more new Bitcoin in circulation. You'll have a maximum of 21 million. The reasoning for this was because of Satoshi's frustration with banks and the idea that if you can produce money at will, then the money has no value. So he wanted a cap on the amount of Bitcoin that could be uh, in existence. And the rationale for the block reward itself, not only is it a minting device, but we want to make sure that people behave honestly. All right, so we know that profit is the primary motivator for, any other, for anyone's actions. And the higher the incentive is for honesty, then the more secure the network's going to be. And because we cannot punish users who are pseudonymous, we don't know them, we have no central registry to check them against, there's no way to effectively like, take away funds from them or punish them. So instead, we have, to we have to reward the honest miners. We have to give them some incentive to spend all this money, spend all this electricity on hardware, or money on hardware, on electricity, on operating costs, just to be part of this voting, voting network. Satoshi said that 
even if a miner has a huge amount of mining power, they need some incentive to stay aligned with the network. So this is what the block reward does. You only get paid in Bitcoin, so if you don't like Bitcoin, if you don't trust Bitcoin, if you don't believe in its value, you have no incentive to be a miner. Right? So this is the rationale for the block reward. And from the block reward, you have the additional transaction fees, which are, as mentioned before, simply the difference of the inputs and the outputs. The transaction sender will make, uh, will put a little bit extra Bitcoin into the inputs with the hopes that their transaction will be approved over someone's el over someone else's. It's typically a ratio of the fees to to byte uh, ratio, so that miners can get the most out of transaction fees as possible. So if you're willing to give someone $100 to get your transaction through, of course they're going to approve it, right? So once transaction fees, uh, or once block rewards become zero, then transaction fees will be the only other way for miners to get rewards, as we see from the scheme. Like once block rewards are zero, the only revenue you have is from transaction fees, which might become in the hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, but that's a discussion for 100 years from now. Right. Then from here we have the mining costs. So the fixed costs that are involved with mining, they strictly involve, they mostly involve hardware costs. Because once you buy hardware, you just need to run it. Right? So there's various types of hardware that are used for mining. There's CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs. And we can see a nice distribution over here. In the first year, you had a lot of CPU mining, which moved to GPU mining, which moved to pretty much directly to ASICs, almost skipping over FPGAs. So CPU mining. We have here the pseudocode. This is the same operation that a computer would need to do. A computer would need to run for about 7.6 million years before finding a single block. So yes, you could say it's a little unfeasible to be mining with the CPU. Keep in mind that uh, like these hardware costs are fixed, so you don't need to uh, like once you have a CPU, you have that CPU for life. You don't really it'll degrade, but you don't need to consider like the uh, variable costs directly here. Then from there you have the GPU, which is an order of magnitude faster than CPUs. So it won't take you 7 million years, it'll just take you 700,000. It's a little better. Uh, this also implies, though, a larger consumption of energy and high production of heat because GPUs were not optimized for mining. Uh, they were most common about five years ago for mining when you didn't have these really advanced technologies like ASICs, and they're still viable for mining Zcash and Ethereum, which have created hash puzzles that are allegedly ASIC resistant. Some disadvantages, though, is that, like previously stated, GPUs have a lot of components that don't really apply to mining. For example, if we see back here in the pseudocode, we have a lot of bit shifts, but we don't have any floating point units. So all of those aspects of GPUs, you don't need inside uh, a mining rig. And on top of that, GPUs are not meant to be run in farms side by side. So if you want a huge mining operation, a, G a GPU farm is probably not the best choice for you, because they weren't designed to do this. From there came the FPGAs, which are also known as Field Programmable Gate Arrays. These were a compromise between Bitcoin-specific hardware and still general use hardware. The reason for this is that some people weren't ready to commit. You know, they thought that if Bitcoin dies, then so does their hardware, if you can only do SHA-256. But if Bitcoin profits really well, they want to make sure they at least have a good amount of uh, hash power so that they can make some profits. But because of the fact that it was very easy to turn FPGAs into full-blown, what are called ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits, uh, you'll hear a lot about ASICs if, uh, if you're in the Bitcoin space at all, because ASICs are the dominating hardware of the network. As you can see here, the, uh, this 14 trillion hashes per second is referring to the Antminer S9, which was developed by Bitmain. It costs about $3,000, but it will only take you 10.9 years to actually find a block, which is much better than 7 million, right? So manufacturing ASICs, there's a huge variety of ASICs that you can get. You can get a higher base cost or higher efficiency. Uh, you can get uh, compact devices versus things that will like, actually have more power. Or you can look for something that, uh, like whatever suits your needs. Right? The problem with ASICs is that they cost a lot to manufacture. So the production of ASICs is very centralized. Uh, you You'll notice that uh, Bitmain, which is one of the main ASIC development, uh, ASIC production companies that lives in China, they produce, I think, about 70% of the network of the of the world's like, hash rate. So most of their 
like they use a lot of their own technology and so do people around the world. So there was recently discovered this thing, one of the readings actually discusses ant bleed, where someone found a back door into these ASICs. So they discovered that if Bitmain wanted to, they could shut down 70% of the world's hash power like in an instant, which is pretty scary considering that we, we designed Bitcoin to be decentralized. So because of this, uh, this ASIC, people were we're a little frustrated that this centralization managed to find its way into what was supposed to be like the fundamental step away from centralization. But uh, that's a, a discussion for further uh, discussion. And uh, from fixed costs, we finally have the variable costs. These refer to the operating costs overall. Uh, for example, the energy that goes into mining. You have three types of energy. The types of energy aren't as important as the concept that this is another way to prove that proof of work is sustainable. You're proving that you're expending all of this energy in order to, in order to participate in the network, in the consensus protocol, and you're saying that this vote is worth this much energy. It's worth the energy that it took to build the hardware, that it took to power the hardware, and that it took to maintain the hardware. So all of that energy is, in a sense, like what you use to make your presence on the community, to, uh, to vote and to participate in the consensus protocol. There's also infrastructure depending on how large of a scale this operation is running at. For example, warehouses and personnel. Those are things that have to be considered because if you don't have someone who's managing it or if you don't have space to run your operation, then you're not going to be able to run it properly. Now one note is that, we keep in mind, everything's about profits, but when we're mining, we're wasting all of this electricity all of this being turned into heat. Right? All of this heat, is there something else we can do with it rather than just waste it? Well, someone came up with an idea called the data furnace approach. So imagine for a second you're living in Alaska, and you have for some reason this giant like GPU rig, and you think, man, I want to make free money. So instead of going out and buying a heater, you actually get paid to heat your own home by running this rig, heating up your house a lot, and you have natural cooling from the environment. So it was interesting. There's a lot of uh, discussion about what would happen if people were to only mine during the nights, or if they were to only mine during the winter. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of things that you can think about, and it's fun to imagine what might happen if everyone operated on the data furnace approach. Like, would no one mine in Malaysia? Only time could tell. And then it comes all the way back to real-world mining. All right, so we've talked about Bitcoin for three lectures now, about the theory about it, the context behind it, but the question is, what does Bitcoin mining look like in real life? This is an example of an ASIC, uh, a Chinese ASIC mining farm. So you can see here that there's some pretty cheap infrastructure around these ASICs. Like, there's just giant fans and kind of shoddily put together a, a racks of, Jeep, uh, of ASICs. But the reason is because they want to cut costs. They want to make as much profit as possible. So they're not concerned about how it looks. They're strictly focused on how much money they're getting for every dollar spent. So they just have natural cooling and they have fans just shoved right against the machinery. There's some water cooling here and uh, another perspective on the mining. There's also ASICs that you personally can buy. This one's the uh, 21 ASIC miner of, uh, well, people have their opinions about it. And then there's the uh, Ants Miner S9, which is the one discussed previously. This costs $3,000, but it's also the most powerful ASIC on the market right now. But keep in mind, as we said, there's a large amount of variance when it comes to this. Like, Sure, you might say that one block is worth $50,000, so it's worth to mine for 10 years to get $50,000 after just like a $3,000 investment. But the problem is that it's so much variance. Do you really want to wait that long for a payout? Would you wait 10 years for like a million dollar check? It doesn't sound plausible. So there's these things called mining pools in which a bunch of people with not too much power will, come, will pool together and put the resources towards the same block. So this is all operated by a pool manager who distributes the tasks and who makes sure that rewards get paid out properly to miners. And those pool managers will take a cut of the rewards for being the operator, for providing the services, and for providing a central point around which miners can uh, give their hash power. The pros is that individual miners and small miners can uh, participate. If any of you have mined, you've probably been part of a pool because it's very unlikely that you would have been mining on your own, looking for a block on your own when you know it's almost impossible to get a block. And it's also easy to update software. As we know, every node in the Bitcoin network has its own version of the software. 
Miners who are in a mining pool don't need to download any information. All they need is to download the pool software so that they can receive the mining puzzle and submit what are called shares as their mining. The problems are that the pool, miner, the pool manager has to be trusted. So here comes another point of centralization. So it's centralized, meaning that it could lead to, if the pool manager is malicious, a redirection of the hash power. And it enables a multitude of attacks, which we'll talk about more in the game theory, like how to destroy Bitcoin lecture. The community does not really like large mining pools for very obvious reasons. One example is ghash.io in 2014. Their pool came up to about, I think it crossed the 50% mining hash rate um, like threshold. So miners who were part of this pool deliberately pulled out because they knew, everyone knew, everyone was freaking out because they did not want to see any entity that was even close, let alone surpassing the 50% mark. So miners were voluntarily pulling themselves out. Like the community is very much against centralization. However, uh, there is, there is a possibility that for some entities who are more concerned about the personal profits, they may be participating in multiple pools through a process known as laundering hashes. And the reason why someone might do this is let's say that your Bitmain, one of the largest companies in China, that's, well, one of the largest Bitcoin companies, happened to be in China, you don't want people to know that you actually control 70% of the network power. So your own pool looks like that, 18.8%, but in reality, you're submitting shares to 50% of every pool here. So you actually have 50% of this remaining 80%. So you have a net like 60, 70%. So by laundering hashes, you can be submitting hash power to the network, getting rewards, and have much more control than people know because they think it's someone else who's the manager, but in actuality, it's like one central entity. So uh, just something to think about. So it's unknown how much, where the actual concentrations of mining hardware lie. So uh, for a, uh, uh, just to, uh, I guess, compare between like, solo mining and uh, mining with a pool. So first and foremost, the network hash rate is about 7.3 terahashes. It, it changes like every uh, so often. And the mining reward is if we have 12.5 times the number of blocks in a year, 657K. So let's assume that we have $4,000 per Bitcoin. So if you want to start mining today, you'd buy an Antiminer S9, 14 terahash. The percent of the network of that, that it, uh, this percent of the network hash rate that you now own is about 0.1, uh, 1.9 to the negative 4%. So your annual reward will be that same percent of the total yearly reward, which is about $5,000 per year. But here's the problem. You don't get paid out until you find a block if you're mining on your own. So you'll only get paid out 50000 once every 10.9 years. And that's, that's a pretty long time to wait. Your mining equipment will probably be outdated by then anyway. So instead, what you can do is mine with a pool. If the pool has one-sixth of the network hash power, then you find every sixth block, you'll get the pool will get a reward every one hour, meaning that you get about 58 cents per hour instead of having to wait for 10.9 years to pass and then finally finding one block. So this is an interesting paradox because as Bitcoin gets more secure, meaning that there's more uh, mining power involved with Bitcoin, then there's a greater appeal for pools because pools reduce variance, so people want to go to pools because the variance is increasing as more mining power is entering the network. And uh, the way that you prove that you're actually mining in a pool because no one can see what your computer is doing is by submitting shares. We know that a valid block has a certain number of leading zeros, but to prove that you're doing work on the relevant puzzle, you submit what are called shares, which are near valid blocks. So if you need 30 leading zeros and you found a nonce that produces a hash with 15, then you can say, hey, I found this nonce. It's kind of close, but it's not close enough. The pool manager will recognize this as proof that you're actually doing some work, <laughs> and they will then pay out based on their selective pooling scheme. So all of these are considered shares, which you submit to prove that you're doing work, because you couldn't find those unless you were actually trying to find the correct answer. Keep in mind that valid blocks, as in other words, nonces that produce valid block headers, are paid out the same way as shares. No one gets more or less for having something that produces a sh um, some header or some nonce that solves the block puzzle. One question might be, why can't people save these shares for themselves? Well, keep in mind, the puzzle is built around the Merkle roots, which contains the Coinbase, or which is uh, built off of the Coinbase transaction, which is pointing to the address of the pool operator. 
So you can't withhold a share, withhold a block, and say, okay, now I found it, so it's mine. You have to redo the puzzle entirely if you want the Bitcoin to pay out to you. And uh, the two types of schemes, there's one that's pay per share, which is better to the miners. Every time you submit a share, you get paid. Easy. It sucks for the pool if they're not able to find blocks, but it's good for the miners because they don't have to worry about the variance of the pool. If your pool isn't finding any blocks, you'll know that you'll still get paid. So this does lead to a problem where the miners don't have incentives to give up nonces that produce valid blocks if this mining pool won't pay you anything extra, which can lead to some attacks as we'll see. And then this proportional, which is actually not implemented because of the fact that it's too detrimental to the miners, uh, or that it's too difficult for the pool to stay sustainable. The pool will pay out when blocks are found, meaning that there's higher variance, but it's better for the pool because they don't pay anything out until they have something in their name. Right? They don't have to promise any money until they've actually found some reward. So the individual miners will bear more risk in this, in this scheme. So are there any questions so far about it? Yeah. To create a pool as an ICO, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Okay, uh, there are pools on Ethereum as well. Uh, as for the Ethereum pooling ICO thing, we'll be going over that in the next lecture more. So, yeah, after you do the readings, maybe it'll clear things up. All right, any other questions? All right, sweet. So, people know that Bitcoin. They want to change because it doesn't meet their vision. Whatever the reason might be, like, for example, the centralization is one big issue because it doesn't align with Bitcoin's original vision to be decentralized, to have no central points of failure. So one question is how can we change the mining puzzle so that we now have a way to ensure decentralization? So for a quick overview on the puzzle requirements, you know, it has to have these certain properties where it's quick to verify, you can just difficulty, it's difficult to compute, right, all these various things. And Bitcoin, as a reminder, is a partial pre image hash puzzle, meaning you just need a certain number of zeros. And why this applies is because we can design certain puzzles that take the load off of the CPU, off of the, like, the thing that ASICs are really good at, and put it onto memory instead. Right, so this, this uh, memory hard refers to something that requires a large amount of memory instead of computational power. And memory bound means that the memory is the, is the thing that restrains how quickly you can solve the puzzle. So memory hard puzzles will viably deter ASICs because ASICs can only compute very quickly. They're not capable of making more memory or reading more quickly from memory. Right? So if the ASICs aren't the thing that's bottlenecking this whole procedure, then having an ASIC doesn't put you ahead of anyone else as greatly. It's only a marginal difference. So it doesn't really pay out as well. So Dogecoin and Litecoin actually use this hashing function called S-script, which is a memory-bound puzzle, or memory-bound hash function. And uh, S-script was originally used for hashing pa uh, passwords or uh, for similar uses, and it was hard to brute force because you have to fill a large buffer with information and then access information from that buffer in a pseudo-random way, meaning that you had to save a huge amount of information and then keep like finding information in this memory. To compute this information on the fly would be more expensive than to just save it in memory, meaning that it's much more advantageous to save it in memory, meaning that now you're restrained by the amount of memory you have and the speed at which you can read and write from this memory. And this was a suggestion, but the issues are that it's equally or equal, it takes an equal amount of energy or computation power to verify, and an ASIC was actually developed for this. So there goes the ASIC resistance. Another idea was to chain 11 or 13 different hash functions together. To make an ASIC for this would be incredibly complex. This is what's used by Dash, one of, um, an altcoin that we've mentioned before. It's significantly harder to make an ASIC for, but it's still been done. There's another idea where you can periodically switch the hashing puzzle. That way someone can't use the same ASIC on the same puzzle. But what if someone just buys the relevant equipment at the right time and then uses their ASIC on some other, on some other coin? Then same problem. You can't really deter someone from using an ASIC. So Mike Hearn says that there's no, there's really no such thing as an ASIC resistant algorithm. And while that may be true, the idea is to try and find some solution that while it might not deter ASICs entirely, it makes the use of ASICs 
only return a marginally higher profit or only give someone a marginally higher edge over someone else. Right? To reduce the variance or the discrepancy between people as much as possible. So some pros of ASIC resistance is that if ASICs dominate the network, they repress, they suppress regular people from being able to participate. Bitcoin was designed around one CPU, one vote. Does this uphold to that same ideal? Right? Without ASICs, people argue that there will be an increase in democracy and a decrease in centralization. Because now you have each person who can like, have an equal say in the network. But some cons are that if someone has invested a large amount into ASICs, they're now bound to this network. And they're not able to get rid of their hardware without having lost a great deal that they spent on it. So if someone has bought an ASIC, they're now like tied to this thing that can only do hash functions, the specific hash function for Bitcoin. It has no other use in the world. So if there is a crash in the exchange rate that's caused by an attack that they do, there goes all of their hardware's use. Now one note is that if they were to rent out hardware mining, or they were, if they were to rent out mining power, then they could have all of the power with none of the baggage. Something to consider. Filecoin was an attempt at creating what's called a non-outsourceable puzzle. Uh, you don't need to analyze all this text. It's a quick overview. Filecoin is a decentralized storage system in which you save information onto your local server and you will be queried at random points about random pieces of information. So when that happens, you're not going to be able to predict what you're going to be asked for, so you just have to, you have to save it all and hope that you can keep showing that you own this information. And then this proof of useful work, another idea of like putting some other use to proof of work. Right, instead of wasting all this computing power on solving a hash function, why don't we try like putting this computing power towards something useful, like large primes, aliens, weather forecasting, or even uh, simulating proteins. But the problem is that because proof of useful work is not generated algorithmically, a lot of problems arise. First and foremost, you might run out of information. You don't have an inexhaustible puzzle space, meaning that if you run out of, if you run out of problems to solve, then you're kind of screwed. Like, what are you going to do from there? The advantage of Bitcoin is that you always have a puzzle to solve. But if you run out of, for example, information from a telescope, then there's nothing you can do. Potential solutions are not equally likely, meaning that it's pretty clear. If you're not equally likely to get something, then someone might be uh, keep getting rewards even though they're not putting in as much computing power. And on top of that, if a central entity is generating these puzzles, then who is to say w whether they know what the answers to these puzzles are? So you're missing that decentralized uh, aspect of the puzzle generation. So unfortunately, in summary, proof of useful work does not work. Right. And finally, consensus updates. Right. So Bitcoin Core is the team of lead developers that works on the Bitcoin software. And Bitcoin Core also refers to the software that you download onto your computer that you'll use to run a full node. And this will like, check transactions for you, host a wallet for you, and all this fun stuff. And the way that you update your protocol is through what's called a fork. Now there's two types of forks. There's hard forks and there's soft forks. A hard fork is when a bunch of nodes are running some version of the software, some nodes upgrade, and these nodes can no longer accept information from each other. At least the old nodes will reject anything that the new nodes, uh, anything that the new nodes are saying. So if I want to increase the block size to two megabytes, and all these new nodes are making block sizes of two megabytes, if I'm an old node, I'll only accept one megabyte, nothing more. So I can't interact with them; they can't interact with me. Then this protocol would split into two; it will fork into two different versions. This is what happened with Bitcoin actually very recently when you had Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. If you're familiar, Bitcoin actually split into two different currencies when one group of people wanted to move on to what's called SegWits and another group wanted to move on to larger block sizes. So you have Bitcoin Cash, which has larger block sizes, and you have Bitcoin, the original Bitcoin, which has SegWits. And because of that, you had this hard fork because you have two different protocols, like two different versions of the same currency, which is the same thing that happened with Ethereum after the DAO hack. A soft fork, on the other hand, is one in which new nodes are doing something more specific than what the old nodes did. So everything that the new nodes do is valid, but the old nodes may not be able to interact with the new nodes. So the old nodes will just think that they're participating, but the new nodes will keep rejecting whatever they're doing. So this sort of incentivizes the old nodes to shift in to upgrade to the new one because they're no longer able to 
act in this participation process. And they're no longer able to participate in the consensus protocol. And the way that you suggest updates is through BIPs. As we mentioned before, there's three different types of BIPs. Uh, if you're interested, you can read more about those. And uh, as, in essence, you signal for a BIP by changing a specific bit in your Coinbase nonce. People can see, OK, for these 100 blocks, how many people have this particular BIP signaled? And then you can estimate the amount of computing power that, was, uh, that is supporting the network towards this particular initiative. Okay. Are there any questions about any of these uh, protocol upgrades that I went through a little quickly? All right, cool. So here's your homework. Uh, this is the final, I guess, Bitcoin like overview <coughs> lecture. So these readings are now going to talk more about Bitcoin in general, like some current events, and then finally the Ethereum white paper, which may be a little technical, but again, I trust that you guys have a solid foundation after these last four lectures. And the homework is to argue. There's going to be a post on Piazza about uh, the different types of prompts you have. One is for ACE resistance. And the other is for deciding who actually controls Bitcoin. Is it the miners, the users, the journalists, investors? That's up to you to decide. All right, uh, go ahead and come up if you have any questions. Thank you.